Welcome to the weekly uh, webinar uh, hosted by the Lancet Psychiatry with United for Global Mental Health, uh, the Mental Health Innovation Network, and MHPSS.net. Those of you who have attended this webinar before uh, will know that each week we come together as a community of people working in mental health around the world uh, to hear from people who've been working in very practical ways to uh, minimize the negative impacts on people's uh, mental health and well-being of the COVID crisis. We've covered a number of topics and I would say that the topic we're going to be covering today is among the most important because this is really the era now where we're thinking about the transition from the immediate impacts of uh, the COVID outbreak on people's well-being and how they're coping to thinking about the longer term impacts that we might have on people's mental health and well-being as the world emerges from this outbreak. We already know the strong links between um, the, the direct impacts and mental health, and that's been covered on a number of occasions. We also know very well that there's a strong link between poverty and mental health. And there's this very well documented negative cycle where um, poverty tends to um, put people at greater risk of mental health problems and the other way around, that people who have mental health problems are more likely to be driven into poverty. We're going to be hearing a little bit more about that uh, and also some ways that people have been finding innovative solutions to, to address this negative cycle. So we have a fantastic um, panel um, with us today who will be with us for the 45 minutes of the um, this broadcast webinar and then afterwards we hope they'll join us and you'll join us to discuss further the other questions that are inevitably going to come out that we can't answer and talk about on Twitter afterwards. So if you want to tweet or if you want to um, engage in in that discussion afterwards you need to use the hashtag um, COVID19MH so hashtag COVID19MH um, please feel free also, if you have want to interact with us to ask questions particularly, to type into the chat box and we'll endeavour to um, address those questions as well in the time that we have before us. So without further ado, I'm going to very briefly introduce the people we have to um, speak with us today. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves in more detail as they talk about their work once we've started. Um, to start with, my name is Julian Eaton. I work for CBM Global. Uh, I'm based in the UK at the moment, um, but have worked a, a lot in Africa particularly. And I also work for the Centre for Global Mental Health at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where the Mental Health Innovation Network is based. Most of our panellists today actually come from a piece of work that the Mental Health Innovation Network did with the World Health Organization to understand what work people are doing in mental health around the world in response to the COVID pandemic. So first of all, we have Daniel Vigo, who's at the University of British Columbia and Harvard Medical School. We have Liron David from Enosh, Israel. We have Fiza Yasmin from Basic Needs Pakistan. Uh, Pooja Pillai from Burans, India, and Kathy Conte from Partners in Health, Liberia. I've had the privilege of speaking to them a little already about their work and really looking forward to, to hearing that. But we're going to start with Daniel, who's going to share a little bit about the research work he's done in this area before we hear about some of the more concrete examples. Please go ahead, Daniel. Thank you very much, Julian. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for hosting. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here with you in this new virtual uh, way of being together uh, that we have, uh, we have had to rapidly get accustomed to. Um, so basically, during the past few months with a number of colleagues, we've been focusing on the uh, public policy approach that different countries have taken to deal with uh, the COVID pandemic. And the more um, relevant distinction that we focus on is the difference between high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries and how 
the, um, the decisions that they've made uh, have impacted their population. Interestingly, um, throughout this process, the uh, landscape has changed immensely. Every week the landscape changes. When we started thinking about this, uh, we were foreseeing a scenario where the, at that point, relative optimism that low and middle income countries had was misguided and we were uh, concerned that the result would be a potentially catastrophic uh, a second wave or rather uh, extension of, of, the, of the first wave of the pandemic. Well, that has come to happen and unfortunately Latin America is now the epicenter of the COVID-19 uh, crisis with um, more than half the world's death uh, happening in, in Latin American countries. Um, and what we have seen is that there is a, first of all, no one knows exactly how to deal with this. This is something that we must acknowledge. What the right combination of uh, public health policies and economic stimulus, what the right uh, response is, no one knows. But what we do know is that there are two wrong ways to do this. One is the policy paralysis that we have seen in places such as Brazil uh, or, or other places where there's a, a denial at the federal level and a, um, a variety of uh, policies at the, at the city and state levels. And we are seeing dramatic situations such as in Manaus where the excess death that we're seeing in the past few months is 300% of the usual death. Because I think, and to summarize uh, uh, the, the, the message that uh, we would have at this point in, and to be uh, um, compliant with the three minute rule, and so this is a dynamic conversation. Um, what we would say is that uh, if we want to consider the whole burden that this pandemic will have, we need to focus on two aspects. One is excess death, all cause excess death because each country reports what each country wants. And we have, again, examples such as Nicaragua, where the obvious death toll is being um, hidden uh, uh, through different uh, mechanisms. Uh, but excess death, sooner or later, will be uh, revealed. And we need to focus. So the scope is excess death and lost economic output. And, this, and the time frame needs to be one year, because we still don't know what the uh, impact will be in countries where the curve is still increasing, such as, for example, in Argentina, where the death toll now is at about 70 something cases, uh, deaths per day, it'll soon be above 100, it'll unfortunately very soon be in 1000 and so on and so forth. So the recommendation would be understanding what the excess death is of all causes compared to the average in previous years and what the lost output has been and is estimated to be in the future uh, uh, year, in the full year. Um, and again, there are other two important parameters, which is what is the system's capacity to respond to the, to the health mm -hmm. tool and what is the country's ability to borrow against its own future to mitigate yeah. economic aspects. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. And, and of course, as, as we see, whenever we start looking at poverty, all of those different parameters are very closely tied to poverty, aren't they? That actually we know already that people have died in greater numbers in lower socioeconomic groups. Uh, we know that it's likely that an economic impact is going to be more for people in insecure um, jobs and in informal labor um, groups. Uh, and, and we know that the, the likelihood of people being able to bounce back easily um, is gonna be reduced if they're, if they're less secure. Uh, so that's 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 really helpful. Thank you. And I think I think we'll see as we talk with with our other panelists the way that they've they've very concretely actually experienced that in the in the um, the work that they're going to be doing. So we're going to come back to a, a number of those um, issues as we as we move on. Uh, I'd like I'd like now to um, invite uh, Liron to to talk a little bit about her work um, in Israel. Although I understand you're not in Israel at the moment, Liron. And at the moment, I'm located in the U.S. Okay, please go ahead. So, hello everyone. Thank you, Julianne, and thank you for the organizer for doing this webinar series and this specific uh, session. Um, my name is Liron David, and I'm working as the Director of International Relations at ENOSH, the Israeli Mental Health Association. Um, this is a national organization in Israel providing community-based mental health services 
in areas of supportive housing, supportive employment and vocational training, um, uh, social skills, and we provide support for families and for youth. Um, we, we are um, funded by the Israeli government by law, and our, um, our model based on the recovery approach. Um, the COVID-19, as, as um, Julian and Daniel said, uh, impacted a lot of people with severe men mental illnesses that in Israel are um, in living, um, most of them living in poverty and rely on governmental support. Um, but we also needed as an organization providing um, supportive services to go back to basic in, in the COVID, in the beginning of the COVID and try to support people basic needs before we are going to the professional rehabilitation process. But what helped us was that we were building the recovery and rehabilitation services before, and we can do a process with a person and with the environment where he lives in. And so we have resources in the community that could help us. We were moving all our services, almost all our services online, but also trying not to leave uh, anyone behind because some of the people doesn't have access to online services or have technological issues. And we um, continued providing face-to-face -face service to people who, can, um, who, who needed to do that. Um, I think we, our, our resiliency program that we were building in advance really helped us with flexibility in, in what we are providing. Um, to help our service user, to help our teams, and to do to pass the crisis, um, and to help our service user pass the crisis. I think one of the important things to notice with when talking about mental health and poverty, that the access gap that is there during peacetime is um, is wider when we are talking about crisis like the COVID, um, and government needs to address that. Uh, we are trying to do that in routine in all kinds of ways, um, but, but we need a more government planning for that. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think, I think it, it's clear and, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing from the others about this, that actually most of you are already uh, working in this area. Uh, and actually, you're already working with a, a group that was generally marginalized, um, either just because they're people with psychosocial disabilities or because they're people with psychosocial disabilities and in poverty already. Uh, I want to turn to, to Pooja now, because I think one of the experiences you've had is that you're able to build on the relationships that you had already established prior to, to this crisis. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, hi, my name is Pooja. And I work with Project Burans, which is a mental health project that works under the broader umbrella of Emmanuel Hospital Association. And we work mostly in the hilly uh, state of Uttarakhand in the north of India. So like you said, Julian, we were already working with highly marginalized communities that were already living in poverty. So the challenges were quite high to begin with. And with COVID, that was just amplified so much more. And because we were working with daily wage laborers, food insecurity just shot up way more than it already was. And uh, like the first thing we decided to do at that time was actually to tap into the networks we had already built uh, based on the relationships we'd built over the last five to six years. And this included uh, religious leaders, religious groups. And one example that comes to mind is uh, we actually networked with the Gurudwara, which is a uh, Sikh temple. The, so they have a practice of uh, serving food on a daily basis in a langar. It's, it's a community thing that they do. And they were already doing that, but we just had to, had to get the food to the right people because people did not have the next, they didn't know where the next meal was coming from. Uh, and eventually when we uh, got to distribution of dry goods, you know, dry ration and essentials, uh, we had to network with the police and luckily for us over the last five years we had built relationships with police with the community leaders so uh, there was some level of trust in us as an organization and uh, coming from a slightly more politically charged environment because in february while we just went into lockdown in march we were dealing with some uh, you know some sort of volatile situation with uh, you know uh, the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment Act and whatnot, there was a lot of mistrust. And 
uh, navigating that was quite uh, difficult and challenging. And I don't think it would have been possible without the existing relationships uh, which we had already had in the community. And these relationships were also useful in doing needs assessment in the community because we had volunteers who were sort of the eyes and ears to actually let us know what are the most relevant and important needs of this time in the community. And I think moving forward from that, we just keeping keeping on working with these volunteers and um, networks that we have built in the community because we don't know when the next zone will go into lockdown. We don't know yeah. what the next big need is going to be. And even in the last month, we have identified more than a more than two hundred people with psychosocial disability, and uh, it's con going to continue being a major challenge, just trying to yeah. message mental health within the whole uh, package of daily needs and yeah. that being addressed. Okay, thank you. That's that's really helpful to know. I think in, in many countries, uh, they've, they've found that the uh, relationships and experiences built in previous crises particularly have, have served well uh, the, for the work they're doing from then, for in this crisis particularly. I want to turn to, to Kathy now. Kathy is based in Liberia with, with Partners in Health. And obviously, Liberia is a country that's um, undergone a number of crises in the past, Kathy. Uh, but I think I think every everyone is different. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the work Partners in Health is doing, particularly engaged engaging with populations who might not easily access care, usually like homeless people. Do you want to tell us a bit about your work? You're muted, Cathy. You need to put your sound on. Yeah, can you can you hear me? Perfect. Go ahead. Oh no, you muted again, Cathy. Sorry. You you you're still muted, Cathy. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, now so can go you ahead. Hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good, yeah. Good, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Really, I'm not from Liberia. I'm from Sierra Leone. I'm in okay. Sierra Leone. Yeah. Oh, okay. In Liberia. <laughs> but, yeah. Partner, partners in Health in Sierra Leone, working for Partners in Health and at the Mental Health Unit. I'm also a Community Health Officer at Clinicians. So like, and you know, Sierra Leone has been going through a traumatic experience, like for the labor war. Let me just give a scenario of this one. We are in a 50 year old woman. We are in like during the labor war. Let me say three of her children were slaughtered in front of her. So due to that, she abandoned the family she even decided to live in the market areas. But during the intervention of Partners in Health, Mental Health Team, when we try, we try our best. And now, as I, I am talking now, she has even rejoined with her family members. Then she is having a support through the Partners in Health. So these are just like an example of what we are doing in our mm. district, the mm. corner district, yeah. What we are doing in the corner district in Sierra Leone. So the partners yeah. the program started. Can you hear me? Yes, please try. Can you hear me? Try it. Yeah. The line is breaking. Sorry about it. You know, we are having a poor network. Yes. Not Do try that. We can hear. So since the program started, since, since the program started and yeah. Yeah. So since the program started in engaging homeless patients, we are in we do go out in the community, identify the homeless patients, coming them with in the clinic. We also help them with financial support. We also help them with food and clothing. But you know. During the outbreak of this COVID-19, what we did, we, added, we identified a caregiver in the community, where in the, care, the caregiver do help us to provide food for the patients. 
when we do give them their support so that they will help us at least to give them their food. We are in first, psychoeducation psycho is being given out in the community. When we talk about mental illness, when it's not demonic or either spiritual, you know, looking yeah. at the parts of this country, so many people think mental illness is demonic or is a spiritual. Yeah. But we give them psychoeducation so that they will know that this one is a medical conditions. Yeah. It can happen with it can happen with anyone in the community. And yeah. at least they help us to identify some of those patients in the community. And we do give them the support. And as I'm yeah. talking now, the district is giving a bravo to partners in health. Because like seeing so many homeless patients in the street, the way they were with now is different. So like this yeah. is really what we are doing as a mental health team in the right. district. Kathy, thank you very much. We'll we'll come back um, to to ask you a few more questions later. I think about the the good work you're doing there. Um, but I just want to um, hear now from the the last person in our in our group um, who's in Pakistan. Um, Dr. Fizza works for Basic Needs, and we've been hearing from most people actually about the importance of basic needs. That we need yeah. to first start thinking about the day-to-day -day needs that people have during um, times of crisis like this. So, um, Dr. Fizza, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say about your work in in Karachi. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm Dr. Fiza. I'm the Chief Executive of Basic Need Pakistan. Basic Need Pakistan is working on the mental health of the marginalized community for the last nine years. Basic Need launched to implement and adopt the five-step model of Basic Need International. These five-step models include the capacity building, in capacity building, uh, we, we train the uh, community health workers and other professionals, teachers, religious leaders uh, to have uh, some uh, to have uh, some learning on the mental illness and then comes to the uh, community health services. Community health services, the journey start from the uh, patient identification to the medical treatment, to the counseling, uh, uh, psychoeducation, home visits, and uh, uh, rehabilitation and to the entrepreneurship. So we believe that unless the patient doesn't work, the patient doesn't work, he is or she is not recovered. So they have to have uh, have some productive role in the society. Then we can say that he or she is recovered from the mental illness. What yeah. we think the poverty generate mental illness, and mental illness raises the poverty. So this is a vicious cycle. So what we think we have to work to break this vicious cycle, which is uh, which is revolving through door it's like a revolving door coming going coming going so mm. and we are very our our heart is very close to the women of the marginalized community for that uh, for their livelihood we have established the six vocational centers for this yeah. vocational center yeah. uh, these women are having a mental illness and through the provision of the vocational trainings entrepreneurship training financial uh, training they are empowered and after they are after getting that training they will form a self-help group with the 25 members and right. the, with the leadership of the the leader the group leader will uh, activate uh, will see the, their activity and and their impart the activity and business activity they will impart a business activity and for that, we give the sixty thousand loan, a loan for it, returnable for after nine months, and uh, so they can make their products and they can have a link linkage in the community, and then they can sell their products and some money. Dr. So this is our work. Yes. Thank you. It's, it's great to hear that you're really trying to address that cycle um, of poverty and mental ill health. Um, from the side of economic empowerment. We've, we've heard other people, like Kathy, for example, talking about addressing it from the aspect of helping people to access services. But can I just ask you concretely, 
how you've adjusted your services because of the um, necessary uh, changes that happened during COVID? Were you able to fit as many people into your workshops, for example? How did you manage that? Yeah, yeah, we have a, in the in one center, we have a capacity of 70 women and uh, they come in the morning and evening shift. So because of the COVID-19 and to following the SOPs of WHO, we have reduced the number. So in the center now they come only a six girls in the morning and six in the evening. So okay. we have we are keeping all that. Uh, uh, we have closed our center only for 15 days. After following that all the that SOPs, we started again because they were having a financial issues and uh, yeah. so we have to start it again. Okay, Th thank you very much, Dr. Fizzer. Uh, Liron, maybe I can ask you a similar question. Uh, you talked about how people were already experiencing access gaps and that was of course increased during a, the time of, um, of this outbreak. How have you addressed helping people to, to close some of those gaps when they particularly need it, but it's harder to do at the moment? So in, in the first uh, um, term of the crisis, we were um, dealing with understanding what we have, how many staff we have, how many people we have and what are their needs, are they quarantined or not, um, is there a lockdown, do they have medication, do they have all the resources that they need? And after mapping everything, um, we started working to move our services online and understand how people can communicate online. We were fortunate to get a donation of cell phones and data for people uh, that can mm. communicate. And the interesting thing and the opportunity that the COVID uh, created for us is that uh, even though we are a national organization, our work was very local in branches. And the COVID and moving online created a, a new sphere of uh, national um, activities uh, for social activities and, and activities for families um, mm. that we support in one-on-one -on -one or in, in, in small groups. Now they could move to a national uh, or a bigger, larger group of people. Yeah. We were, the, the online also enabled us to get to a more peripheral areas that people um, a lot of time can't. I come to the group or come to the club and they need yeah. to, to drive by bus or so. so now they can just join the Zoom or join the Facebook page right. that we have. So that was one thing. And, um, and also understanding with the person how they can uh, allocate resources in the community through their recovery program, recovery plan, uh, continue to do the uh, case management and support to people um, yeah. in, their, uh, in their community. Um, yeah, I think that that's the building blocks that yeah. we have that could Great. could enable that. Great. Okay, th thank you. So we've heard really amazing stories of how people have tried to plug the gaps of of people's access to really basic needs during during these um, during these extraordinary times. But of course, poverty is really driven by structural inequity and difficulties in accessing rights. And one of the things I think has been a, a theme running through what everyone's doing is building people's opportunities in the future and maybe even looking positively at a, at a world after COVID where we've realized how important it is to be working together and, and moving forward together. I know that uh, one of the things that you're doing in um, Project Burns, um, Pooja, is to be looking at how you can make sure that people who typically don't have much of a voice are able to, to have more of a, of a uh, way of expressing clearly what they want in, in that future. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Julian. Uh, so now, the, the thing about the groups we are working with, most people have not even been to school. So talking on a larger platform or, you know, sitting in front of a camera and like on a webinar or something, it's far beyond what they're comfortable with. So over the last few years, since 2017, what we've been doing in Project Burans is to actually include people with lived experience as part of an experts by experience group. And they're also part of the Burans advisory group. And um, we try our best to co-produce tools with them for intervention. So for example, we had a pictorial recovery tool that we co-developed with an experts by experience group. Similarly, all the interventions that we've had over the years, 
we have uh, made it a point to you know take it through the experts by experience group and uh, have their voices heard and this group is where this group is literally the middle ground where you know the world view the the sort of uh, the research view of mental health uh, comes to terms with the real view of what's happening and the real needs of what's happening in the community uh, is heard from the people in the communities and uh, our group and our staff a lot of our staff are all made of people with psychosocial disability caregivers of people with psychosocial disability and uh, people with lived experience of mental illnesses in the community Thank you, Daniel. I wonder if I could if I could turn to you now. You talked very powerfully about the way that we're all human, and excess mortality, I think, is going to be a very clear measure of how we've done in in managing um, mortality, particularly. And we we know that will be probably unequally spread around society. But on a on a kind of policy level, do you see any easy um, messages that we can be giving to governments in countries where we're working, for example, about how we can make sure that this link with mental health and poverty is understood and how we can try to address the best way to, to, to change both of those things in a positive direction on a policy level. If with many of the people listening to the web, this webinar will be working in advocacy with their governments. Yes, uh, so, sorry, uh, you were asking me, right? Yes. 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 Um, so my main concern is that so far, even in the countries that have tried to do things, particularly low and middle income countries, those that have tried to institute uh, purposeful policies, there's a all, almost laser uh, sharp focus on the virus causing deaths and trying to limit that. And though maybe they have been successful in that, the or let's say the other side of that coin is that the wealth of those countries has been almost destroyed overnight. And the even though uh, there's an apparent success in controlling the curve of cases, um, there, for example, let's take the countries that are some of the countries that are represented here in terms of Argentina. Pakistan and India, and I don't have information on, on Sierra Leone about this now, but both of those three countries have a very similar curve that is still going up, is still steadily going up. In Argentina, there's around 70 something uh, deaths uh, per day at this point, which is similar to Pakistan. Uh, in India, there's about 500 or more. A anyhow, I'm looking at, at uh, pool data that may be a couple of days old or something, but the curve is still going up and it'll keep going up if the information from other countries is, is any template of how the, the virus uh, uh, um, affects people. Uh, and so the wealth that is being destroyed every day that people are not allowed to work and allowed to interact with each other, and, and again, as you have said, uh, this illness affects people uh, differently depending on regions and depending on vulnerabilities. And so people with severe mental illness, for example, are probably the most, uh, the, the, the most at risk people of all after the elderly. And if we think of the elderly with mental disorders, it, it almost, um, it, it, it's almost catastrophic for what is happening with them. And so my message would be, we need to consider any public policy that doesn't consider together the point where the country is in terms of the excess mortality. And by the way, the figures I just quoted are not excess mortality. They are deaths attributed to, to the virus. The excess mortality is in, in some of these cases unknown, but of course, much, much, uh, much more important than this. But any policy that doesn't take into account excess mortality for the coming year, not for the coming day, which is what many governments are focused on. In Argentina, for example, um, who seems to be now the poster boy for, for uh, public health policy because they, they seem to have achieved what high income countries want to achieve in terms of a low number of, of deaths uh, per day, but what they don't 
focus on is that Argentina has zero ability at this point to borrow from the future to pay for people to stay at home. And so in the largest uh, province of Buenos Aires, we have wealth destroyed and we have people with a stringent uh, quarantine at home enforced by the mm -hmm. police and basically a, a ticking time bomb for the, for the near yeah. future. So yeah. my, my, my rapid message is we need to consider uh, excess mortality, lost output, ability to borrow from the future, and health systems capacity. Those are the four factors. Yeah. And any policy that doesn't look at those four for one year time frame is failing its yeah. people. Yeah, I, I think it's clear that um, governments have a very tough decision to make often, don't they, about the, the point at which to, to find that balance between closing down things because of a, a spread of a, a virus in a very physical way and the social impacts. One of the things that I know many of uh, the people uh, watching this, this webinar will be thinking is how we make sure that our particular group of interest, uh, people with psychosocial disabilities, are not left behind. And we heard very powerfully from Pooja the, the importance of making sure that they themselves express what they want. Uh, and we've heard from, from several of our, um, of our presenters the importance of directly addressing economic empowerment as well as as just um, mental health services. Uh, we, have a, we have a few minutes uh, left, so if anybody um, is keen to ask a question, then please do um, send a message on the, on the chat. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on my emails to see if, um, see if anyone um, wants to do that. But in the meantime, I want to pick up on something else that Pooja mentioned, actually, about trust that in many countries where we've been working in CBM, um, both actually during this crisis and also during the Ebola crisis in West Africa and before, we found that it was when people had people they trusted giving them health messages that they were able to really respond positively to them. Whereas some of the international messaging that's been um, going around um, isn't trusted and the internet breeds a lot of um, very strange messages and sometimes that can't be trusted um, and a lot of very paranoid ideas. Uh, and one of the things that the WHO says very clearly in its, in its good messaging about looking after your own mental health is that we really should try to make sure that we look at good advice uh, rather than immersing ourselves in a range of the information that's available online. So. I wonder if any of our, our speakers want to say anything about the work they're doing in um, making sure that their particular group of people, if they're working in, in the area of mental health, are able to access good uh, health advice to make sure they have as much of, of an opportunity to stay well and protect themselves as anyone else in the community, just making sure that their right to, to health is protected in that way. What we can do, can I say something? Please go ahead. Yeah. What we can, yes, we can do the early early detection and early prevention of the mental illness. For that, we are doing the mental health first aid training. I think this is a need of the time that we should start some mental health first aid training in general, mm -hmm. so the yeah. people uh, could be aware of their like uh, mental problem and they can have yeah. a help. And we can because we are the poor country, so we can't afford that uh, the treatment. Expensive treatment is very expensive, so we need to do the early detection, early prevention for that. Yeah. It's very important we do that. Yeah. Thank you. That That's very helpful. And one of the main messages we've really been understanding here is that the, the uh, army of people needed to support mental health is not a group of professionals only, but it's really frontline workers who've often had the most most important impact on, on and they need really good basic mental health skills. So that kind of awareness yeah. raising Relations is really important for making sure um, that all those people have a sense of the emotional I, component of this. I want Go to ahead. add something more that the poverty elevation the, and the organization should be collaborated with the mental health NGOs 
because yes. the poverty and the match there should be some collaboration and the government yeah. policies to form the small uh, the com economic economic community economics project economic based project yeah. in the community marginalized these two things yeah. are very important what i feel there should be a poverty yeah. elevation collaboration with the mental health and poverty alleviation collaboration and the community based uh, yeah. projects so, economic projects dr fizzer thank you for making that very important point that there will be in the long term important efforts programs government um, policies around poverty alleviation and it's very important that we make sure that people with disabilities of all sorts um, and people who are marginalized in different ways, but particularly people with psychosocial disabilities are not left behind, that they have as much of a right to access those as anyone else. And it's a very common experience in many parts of the world where even where those programs are supposed to be targeting the poorest and the most marginalized, they tend to exclude people with mental health problems because they're not considered able to benefit or not considered to be important enough to, to benefit. So that that standing up for our rights uh, and making sure that people affected have a well-organized body who can really stand up for their right to benefit as much as anyone else i think is going to be really crucial uh, i i we have a few minutes now and i really want to uh, make yeah. sure everyone has an opportunity to give one more um, I think we're getting some echo here to give one more message so um, I, I asked all of the um, I, I gave them some pre-warning all of the panelists here if they have one thing they wanted to say about about poverty um, and mental Ill health in the in the context of COVID what would it be so I'm going to um, work my way around the, the group now to see um, what their what their key takeaway points are from from this webinar so can I start with you Liron Yes, um, I think that community support, recovery approach, and resiliency framework really helped uh, our service users um, to to pass this crisis. But it's also great tools towards independence and towards participation of people with disabilities um, in the decision making process. And governmental support is one of that. So, thank you. I, I think you got three points in there. Well done. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to move on to Pooja now. Please go ahead. Uh, so I think uh, coming out of lockdown, there's going to be a large like mass movement of NGO workers and grassroots level workers who are going to be at the forefront of working with communities. And I think it would be really important to message mental health as part of every community based intervention and mm -hmm. actually getting the message out to the larger population because even India, like similar to Sierra Leone, we have a highly magical religious setting where, you know, you are talking about remote areas where people, you know, think that they've been possessed by a spirit and it's not an illness. So actually yeah. very, you know, clearly packaging the message of uh, mental well-being into any and every uh, frontline community yeah. intervention is really important that's a, a really really important point thank you Pooja uh, Kathy can I can I turn to you what's your your take-home message from this webinar yeah so like um, you know mental illness should be a priority conditions really mm -hmm. because like first mental, mental illness was not measured among health conditions but like looking at me it now since I joined the mental health unit and also since I've joined partners in health, seeing really how people were stigmatizing the community, how yeah. people were abandoned in the community, how people were neglected in the community because of mental illness, just because they say it's not a medical condition. Mm. Just as I mentioned, some people say it's demonic, some people say it's spiritual. So that's yeah. why it's really like to continue to engage the spiritual yeah. part, the spiritual fathers, and also the traditional healers. So like yeah. even as I'm, as I'm talking, we are even having traditional healers coming to our clinic. We are even yeah. having pastors coming to yeah. our clinic, coming up with clients, coming up with patients, saying that we know 
you guys you can yeah. do this one you can right. you can change you can change this person looks so with all this one yeah. psycho education is really important and yeah. also meta to be a priority conditions yeah thank you kathy that's incredibly important that we need to be engaging with the people who work in these spaces uh, and of course the the um professionals in mental health have an important role but we really need to be looking beyond the spaces we've traditionally worked in i think thank you for that important point um dr fizza yeah my message is very small and that is uh, the fear divides and the hope mobilize you the person and uh, i think one should keep the hope high and follow the model of msc msc mean mask social distance and cleansing and cleaning of the hands yeah. this yeah. msc model they should follow the msc model in this and they can work if they follow these models and they can work in the community great thank you and then and then finally um daniel your your um final thoughts yes so my final thoughts would be again focus on excess mortality and focus on lost output throughout a year both in terms of forecasting it in order to to uh, ground uh, domestically developed uh, public policies that are cognizant of the difference within regions uh, and, and, and within uh, vulnerability groups. So there's a recent UN report that says that about 40 million, 35 million people will be plunged into extreme poverty um, in this year alone because of, of the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. half of them in, in Africa. Um, and, and we know that poverty kills and we know that poverty uh, has a direct effect on mental health and it will kill first people with severe mental illness and so yeah. anyhow I, I i just couldn't um couldn't stress enough how yeah. of course there is no mental health but there's no health there's no uh, survival for for people that are in vulnerable positions and governments that are not thinking about public policy in a yeah. comprehensive manner Thank you very much. And I'd, I'd like to thank all of our, our speakers today who've done such a, a wonderful job of, of sharing their practical experiences in countries and some of the lessons we're learning uh, through research. Uh, as we close, we're going to continue the conversation on hashtag COVID19MH. So please, um, please follow that on Twitter and ask any questions that you want to, to um, continue discussing. Uh, next week, we'll have a webinar entitled How to Support Patients and Caregivers, which is going to be further uh, drawing on the people who, who shared their wonderful stories on the mental health innovation page um, from people all around the world who are really working in very practical ways uh, in, this, in this pandemic. So thank you for um, coming today, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Bye-bye.